Welcome to Parasitic Diseases. Today we're going to be beginning our section on helminths, the worms. We've just completed the section on protozoans, so we're moving from the very small to the very large. Yet, as we will see, some of the very large are still pretty small. So helminths is a general term applied to all worms, and these worms, in general, are of three kinds. We have nematodes, or nematodes, depending on how you would like to pronounce that, which are non-segmented roundworms. Now, we can all think of a segmented roundworm, right? The annelids, the worms that are found in the ground, earthworms. These are different, but some of these also live in the ground. We'll see about that in a minute. Then there are the cestodes. Cestodes are segmented, and they're flat. And we commonly call these tapeworms. And finally, we have the trematodes. The trematodes are sort of a mix between non-segmented and flat. So trematodes are non-segmented, and they're flat, and they're very complicated in their lifestyles, as we will see as we get to them. But the first group we're going to discuss are the nematodes. Now, they're all eukaryotes, of course. And the best example I can tell you about is Xenorhabditis elegans, and it's the one which is now the genetic model for that stage of life uh, in the environment. So Xenorhabditis elegans is a nematode that was isolated from soil, and then colonized, and then cloned, and then studied ad nauseum. We now know everything about this worm that we can possibly know. We know how many genes it has, we know what the genes do, we know which every cell in this organism does, uh, and we've discovered much about biology in general by simply looking at an organism that not only has a gut tract and muscular system and an excretory system, but it also has a brain. This is the first group of organisms that we'll be discussing that has a brain. It's a very simple brain, but it controls a lot of what this worm can do. And if you can imagine what a Xenorhabditis would be like as a parasite, then that gives you some clue as to where we're heading in terms of our discussion of nematodes in general. Now, for the most part, nematodes are not parasitic. In fact, the great majority are not. But, and most of them live in soil, but they live in some other weird places as well. They can live in ice. They can live at the bottom of the ocean. They can live at the top of Mount Everest. They can live virtually wherever there's land or some substrate to take advantage of, even though their metabolism might be rather slow in some of these instances, we can still find them there. So nematodes are opportunistic in terms of the environment. And that includes us because we're part of the environment. Now, when we, when we discuss parasitic nematodes, we're discussing some 4 billion people throughout the world, harboring some form of nematode parasite. And in fact, as we'll see, our first example, pinworm infection, probably infects virtually every human being on this planet. There are a group of helminths. In this case, they're called geohelminths. They all happen to be nematodes. That they're transmitted in a, ver in a really simple way. The parasite sheds a stage which then is deposited in the feces. The feces then disintegrates as nature takes over and recycles all of that, all those goodies in our excrement, because to the rest of life forms on Earth, that represents fertilizer, by the way, and a nutrient opportunity. The eggs of those parasites, eggs, notice I'm saying eggs now, can then be ingested by things like earthworms. And the earthworm travels throughout the soil and redeposits those eggs in other places other than where they were originally deposited. And then we can encounter them in our food, in our water, and they infect some four billion people collectively. And we're, we're going to discuss their biologies as we get to them. So helminths, now we're back to all of them. This includes uh, nematodes, cestodes, and trematodes, they occupy a variety of places in our body, primarily the uh, alimentary tract. The small and large intestine are favored sites for a lot of these because that's the first place that they encounter after we ingest them. Very few can actually penetrate the unbroken skin and gain entrance that way, but we'll see there are some that can do that as well. They can occupy the cavities in the body, like the 
uh, cavities of the stomach. They can uh, they can uh, occupy the cerebrospinal fluid. They can go into various organs and tissues. They can become involved in the circulatory system. The filarial parasites certainly are in that category. They can also infect the lymphatics as well. And then finally, we have a lot of uh, helminths that stay within the skin or in the subcutaneous tissues. But notice that's not such a small number. 56 different species of helminths have been known to do that in humans. When we look all together at the various categories of helminths and then break them out in terms of uh, nematodes and cestodes and flat uh, flatworms or the flukes, the, uh, the uh, trematodes, we can now see that they don't all infect uh, at the same numbers. The number of species, for instance, for platyhelminthes, and that includes both the flukes and the uh, tapeworms. Uh, collectively, there are more species that infect humans than just the nematodes. But, you know, this is basically what the human condition encounters throughout the world every single day. But we have answers for these infections as well. It's not all one-sided, and not all these nematodes and cestodes and trematodes succeed when they infect the human host. And just to give you an overview of the way the immune system breaks apart in terms of handling protozoan infections, which we've already discussed, and these newer entities, which we will be discussing, uh, they seem to vary quite a bit in terms of the branches of the immune system that can interact to prevent them from succeeding. Uh, it's mostly a Th1-based immunity for the protozoans, and mostly, mostly, and notice I'm saying there might be exceptions here, but mostly it's a Th2 uh, immune system which interferes with the uh, biology of the helminths. A lot of cytokines are elicited also during these infections, and some of them have something to do with protection, and others actually have something to do with innocent bystander effects, which actually uh, creates more morbidity and sometimes mortality in the infected uh, individual. Hello again. Now, you're going to be getting from me the perspectives of a clinician. I'll be giving again a clinical vignette, discussing a little bit about clinical disease, diagnosis, and treatment. And as we go through all that you've learned from the introduction, the life cycle, the cellular and molecular pathogenesis should inform you, should give you a chance to think about why are we seeing this particular clinical disease? Why are we seeing this manifestation? And then thinking about that help you with how are we going to approach diagnosis? And then treatment, treatment will be capping off. What do we do once we have seen the disease, made the diagnosis? How do we actually make our patients better? I glossed over that very rapidly because we'll be returning to those subjects as individual parasites become discussed throughout this uh, exciting new section on helminths. If you want to see something about how geohelminth in general uh, affect public health, uh, here's a nice review article for you. So the next time, we're going to delve into the nematodes. Thanks for listening.